Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. New details on an accident that left a pedestrian dead. The identity of the person behind the wheel is raising some questions. The U.S. has two reported reinfections of people with COVID-19. What that means in terms of immunity and the vaccines we're all waiting for. And shocking new details in the alleged plot against Governor Whitmer as we learn what may have caused the FBI to start rounding up suspects. The alleged domestic terror plot to kidnap and possibly kill Governor Whitmer tops our news tonight at 6. Here are the sketches from federal court today in Grand Rapids where three of the men in federal custody were denied bond. Defense attorneys argued there was no real plan, just a lot of talk. But an FBI agent offered disturbing new details on what the men were allegedly discussing. He said the men were also discussing kidnapping Virginia's governor, Ralph Wortham, Northam, I should say. One suspect, uh, I'm sorry, one suspect, Caleb Franks of Waterford, is allegedly heard in an audio recording talking about his willingness to set fire to Governor Whitmer's vacation home and saying he'd be okay with killing her. The agent also said Daniel Harris of Lake Orion pushed the idea of shooting and killing Whitmer, possibly posing as a pizza delivery man to get close to her home. Also revealed today is what may have convinced the FBI it was time to take action and start rounding up suspects. It was a YouTube video by a local man who was upset about a traffic stop. Local 4 defender Sean Lay explains how that online rant led to real movement by agents after months of intelligence gathering. The FBI had at least two men on the inside, giving them information, leading them through this plot week after week, all summer long. But the FBI jumped in and acted October 7th. Why then? It may have been due to a traffic stop down in Canton and threats made against the Canton Police Department. You need to know who the people are that are taking your rights. Brandon Casera of Canton, one of the men in federal court today in Grand Rapids, charged in the plot to allegedly kidnap or kill Governor Whitmer, is a self-proclaimed President Trump-hating, government-hating anarchist. And the FBI took note when he went on a YouTube rant in September when Canton police pulled him over. You gotta know who the enemy is. The FBI had informants inside following the plot, but Caserta's Alleged threats made the FBI finally move in, we're told. Caserta allegedly told the group they could practice its state house attack, an attack on the governor right in Canton by targeting to kill Canton police officers. The U.S. attorney for this district not ready to talk about that aspect of the case quite just yet. Can we ask one question about the Canton situation that came up? So, not today, thank you. Canton police getting back to us if they were aware these threats were being made against them. Three of the men in court today being held without bond. Bond on two others will be decided Friday. In Grand Rapids, Sean Lay, Local 4 Defenders. Okay, Sean. We're learning more about an accident last month in Birmingham. A man was hit and killed in the early morning hours on Maple Road near Coolidge. The driver did stop and called 911, but Victor Williams has new details about who that driver was and the vehicle they were driving. Well, this incident happened towards the end of September, but now more light is starting to finally shed on the details about who exactly was behind the wheel of this fatal accident. A few weeks ago, a vehicle owned by Bloomfield Township and driven by a Bloomfield Township official was involved in an unfortunate accident. That was Bloomfield Township Attorney Dirk Beckerlag addressing the investigation into an employee being involved in a fatal accident involving a pedestrian while in a township car. The necessary persons, including township board members, were apprised of the accident and advised that an investigation was being conducted by the appropriate law enforcement agency. While she did stop to call 911, reports show it was a 60-year-old woman behind the wheel traveling around 3.30 the morning of September the 22nd, when she allegedly hit a 30-year-old walking on West Maple Road. Police aren't releasing her name while the incident remains under investigation. The investigation is still ongoing, and therefore, in order to not interfere with or negatively impact an investigation, the township at this time will not be commenting any further on the details of this matter. And Birmingham police, they tell me that they're still waiting on the toxicology reports for not only the driver, but the victim as well. Victor Williams, Local 4.
that. All right, Victor. Today's numbers from the state health department show Michigan is facing an even bigger challenge to contain COVID-19. The state is reporting 1,237 new cases of COVID-19 and 30 additional deaths. Michigan's chief medical executive, Dr. Janae Caldoun, said today this may be the beginning of a second wave of the virus in our state. Meanwhile, Dearborn Public Schools has decided to extend online learning another month. The district had originally planned to be online until at least October 1st. That was pushed back to October 12th, and Monday it was extended another month. The board plans to reevaluate conditions at a board meeting October 26th while continuing to expand in-school learning labs that began last week. For COVID-19 survivors, one comforting thought has been at least you might have some immunity to future infections, but that might not be uh, the case. Our doctor Frank McGeorge is here with two new reports of people becoming reinfected right here in the U.S. Yeah, Jason, the first well-documented case of a COVID reinfection was from Hong Kong. Since then, there have been scattered reports from other parts of the world. In most of those cases, the second infection was not as severe as the first. Now, two U.S. cases are challenging that. The first U.S. report of a SARS-CoV-2 reinfection was published in the journal Lancet Infectious Diseases. The patient was a healthy 25-year-old resident of Nevada who initially tested positive on April 18th. At that time, he had mild symptoms of sore throat, cough, headache, nausea, and diarrhea. Nine days later, his symptoms were gone and repeat tests for infection were negative. But... On May 28th, weeks after his initial infection, he became sick again and tested positive again for COVID-19. This time, though, his symptoms were more severe and he required oxygen. The researchers are confident that this was a reinfection, not a relapse, because the genes from the first and second virus were different. A second U.S. reinfection was also published in the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases. That patient was a healthy 42-year-old Virginia military health care provider. On March 21st, he developed a cough, fever, and body aches. At that time, he tested positive, and he improved over 10 days. After more than a month, he was re-exposed when someone in his household developed COVID-19. This time, he developed worse symptoms, including an abnormal chest x-ray and low oxygen levels. He tested positive again for COVID-19. Samples of virus from the first and second infection had differences, suggesting reinfection. Now, at this point, these reinfections do not appear to be common, but they raise questions about how much immunity is actually produced with an infection or whether something else could be the cause, like a bigger second exposure developing the infection. Yeah, and Doc, does it raise any questions about how effective a vaccine might be? Well, you know, Jason, that's a reasonable concern, but there is no evidence that the reinfection happened because the virus changed in a way that it was able to sneak past the immune system. In point of fact, it's actually hoped that the immunity that someone gets from a vaccine would be better than from a natural infection. So there are better hopes in the future. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Doc. Kim? All right, we are just 20 days away from the polls opening on Election Day, and there's a massive push from campaigns on all sides to get people to the polls and vote. And we've learned the motivation to vote is higher than ever among African Americans. Tonight, exclusive poll numbers give us a closer look at what's behind that sense of motivation. Local 4's Larry Spruill is live with a Voices of a Nation report. Larry, you've been digging into the data with our pollster. Uh, so what group is driving it? Well, Jason and Kimberly, the numbers are at an all time high and their health is what's driving black voters this year. This election means everything to me and my family. Wife and mother of three, Autumn Evans says she's already made up her mind on who she's voting for. This election really made me cognizant of the fact that this country is not really protective of black families and why she's voting. I'm dismantling um, racist systems, the school to prison pipeline, um, a lot of the, the housing inequality. Um, so those are some of the most important issues to me. And in a recent poll for Local 4 and the Detroit News, pollster Richard Zuba asked the question of black voters. What's driving them? African-American voters, black voters in Michigan, very strongly are coming in on the side of pre-existing conditions, support for pre-existing conditions. They oppose the overturning of Roe v. Wade. They oppose uh, a Supreme Court nominee being voted on now. 
Zuba asked black voters how motivated they are to vote in November on a scale of 1 to 10. The higher the number, the greater the motivation. That is a historically high level. Now, Zuba says according to the poll, 35 percent of black voters here in Michigan plan on voting absentee if they have not already. 78 percent believe the nation is on the wrong track. 93% have an unfavorable opinion of the president. 76% have a favorable opinion of former Vice President Joe Biden. And 67% are motivated to vote to protect pre-existing conditions. The virus isn't just um, a fulcrum point for how black voters are making a decision. They're fulcrum point for all voters. Evan says that's one of her reasons, too. Voting is a very practical and, and powerful way to push back against oppression, so I'm going to do my part. And in 2016, the motivation number among black voters to vote was just a 6, and again, this year, it's a 9.5. We're live tonight. Larry Sproul. Local four. And Larry, we know early voting and absentee voting going on right now. A lot of people taking advantage of that. What are the polls saying about the effect of people going to the polls early? Yeah, Kimberly, well, at the polls are showing that a lot of people are taking advantage of early voting and absentee voting. As a matter of fact, only 51 percent, according to the poll of voters, will be going to the actual polls to cast their ballots. Kimberly? Yep, an interesting election indeed. OK, Larry, we appreciate it. Another doorbell camera captures someone stealing, but this time it wasn't just a package snatched off the front porch. We'll have that coming up. Plus, here's Ben. We've got a, one more nice day ahead of us. That is tomorrow, but then the weather impacts start to become more noticeable. Showers Thursday and some cold temperatures going into the weekend. We'll look at both of those next. It was just over a year ago, a Detroit firefighter nearly died. I just knew I was burning, and it feels pretty urgent. And it has been a very long road back for this firefighter who also has another very important job for Metro Detroit's kids. We'll have his story.